host the Mississippi Historical Association Society meeting, we hope, in the uh, Holiday Inn Plaza in Centennial Plaza. No, Holiday Inn Resort, I'm yes. sorry, in Centennial Plaza. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll hear more about that from Geo Oberlander, who is uh, <coughs> going to tell us a lot more about it than, than we know right now. Yep. Well, thank you everyone for inviting me to speak. Um, I've had the privilege of meeting a couple of you thus far just in my uh, travels throughout the city. Uh, Jim and Joe and Paul. Um, I'm here today to, I guess, open the doors behind a property that you folks have been familiar with. You've been driving by it for the past X amount of years and maybe uh, haven't had the opportunity to, to step inside. Uh, I represent the company that was selected by the city of Gulfport to uh, kind of help develop the old gal and turn her from what was um, a psychiatric services facility for the Veteran Affairs Medical Center uh, in Gulfport <coughs> and turn it into a, a bit of a crown jewel for the Gulf Coast and a crown jewel for the community. And it's something that, uh, you know, we're going to tear the fences down soon enough and uh, try and host a series of yearly events on site that should drive foot traffic and drive tourism in the area, increase sales revenue, but those are all later components of the pre presentation. Let me get started with the, uh, the beginnings. <coughs> so a little bit about us uh, and then the company I represent. Uh, we're Lurtree Off Property Group. Uh, we're out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Started in 1987 by a group of brothers from Avoyles Parish, the Junos. Uh, they started as realtors in the state of Florida, then they operated a realty company that got up to the point of, I think, uh, 80 employees to 2,000 agents, and they grew from 80 million in sales to a billion dollars a year. Uh, they then turned their eyes towards real estate development. <coughs> they began with uh, low income housing tax credits, so they are familiar with uh, the, the historic and the tax credit entities that operate within the Gulf South. <coughs> Our flagship product, which you'll see a, a picture of here in a minute, is the Ritz-Carlton in New Orleans. Uh, it was something that was developed um, back when Canal Street maybe wasn't as festive of an environment as it is today. Uh, circa 1999, 2002, uh, the development on the old Maison Blanche department store began. And it was a rather sprawling complex that they managed to wrangle together and build three hotels uh, out of what was that old uh, retail system. And it really sort of was a shot in the arm to the revitalization of downtown New Orleans at the time. Unfortunately, the building was damaged during uh, Katrina, and they conducted some light repairs afterwards. But since their work, uh, you know, that section of New Orleans has certainly undergone a bit of a regrowth, and that's with some of the projects that they've conducted in the past, that's something that uh, maybe this company might be actually known for. Uh, but that's that's them themselves, you know, about half a billion dollars in total development value of the projects, some examples of which you'll see here in a second. The second component of Centennial Plaza LLC is uh, a partner of ours who operates out of California, but he's in a Mobile, Alabama boy made good. Um, he runs Housing Advisors LLC, uh, they themselves have developed a real estate portfolio of in excess of $5 billion. So the nuts and bolts of these two little paragraphs here is just to show that we've got a little bit of experience, you know, taking care of some old buildings and <coughs> developing areas that maybe other developers uh, haven't been exactly able to plant their flags. The third component, um, well, let me start here with uh, the list of folks. Stu, Stu Juno, uh, one of the Juno brothers from the Royals Parish, is the chairman of the company. Uh, Colonel Mike Juno, uh, he's a former helicopter jockey out of Fort Hood, uh, full bird retired <coughs> in 1987. Uh, and then Neil Juno, who is the head of the finance wing. Those are the, the three heads of our company that are the ones who were approached by the city and have uh, really led the development on this project from day one. And then the rest of the folks here, including myself and my brother, uh, we're just, I guess you could say, functionaries of the, the Great Wheel. But the third component of this project that I can't be remiss to, to bring up is 
the Gulfport Redevelopment Commission, and that's a group of uh, six individuals, uh, Ms. Carolyn Meadows, Sal Domino, uh, Don Hall, Don Mason, Arnie Williams, who's a younger fellow from uh, Mississippi Power, and then Dr. Jim Kelly, or John Kelly, who's the city administrator for the city of Gulfport. Uh, they are our partners in this project just as much as I am or just as much as the Junos are. Uh, the city have been over backwards to help us in every manner that you can imagine in terms of uh, ideas, you know, generating public interest, uh, helping us develop a, an event calendar that hopefully will span this decade and the next <coughs> as well as you know minor things like permitting and uh, constructability issues but we did if there was any city representatives here i wanted you to know that you're not forgotten you've been a big help to us thus far but this is our real estate portfolio this is what we've developed over the years uh, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner it totals about uh, half a billion dollars in net worth this being the flagship product the maison blanche department store which is now the ritz carlton in new orleans it was completed in August of 99, and it really did act as a shot in the arm to the development of Canal Street, which uh, runs north and south there to the west of the building. Uh, this was a project that we undertook. It was an old, I'll, I'll be kind and say a rundown hotel um, that needed a facelift. And so instead of giving it a facelift, we tore it down and built a giant big building in its place. Um, what you see here, these three greenscapes, are actually uh, the top of a three-story parking garage that mm -hmm. allows for the residents who live on the north face of this building here, when they look out onto the city, which is Harbor Village in Florida, uh, they're looking down onto the top of you know, a manicured park as opposed to a cement parking garage. So uh, it shows a little bit of the ingenuity that we're able to bring to a project like Centennial Plaza and um, you know some of the care that we have to not only our guests and our residents but also to the, the city as a whole. This project actually also led to the revitalization of the um, St. Andrews development area within Panama City uh, back when it was conducted in 2006. <coughs> this here uh, Majestic Sun, rather large condominium building um, this was right at the heyday of uh, the condo market in Florida. And, uh, it, you know, it got to the point where folks were walking in, signing a deal for $250,000, and by the time they were out to their car, they were selling it for $350,000, and the ink hadn't even dried on the checks yet. So um, by that point, you know, we thought to ourselves, well, let's kind of tone down our efforts and focus more on uh, some smaller scale projects. And one of which, which we're really proud of, this is actually where we host our offices in Baton Rouge. Uh, it's the Lake Sherwood Village Retirement Center. It's an independent living facility in Baton Rouge. It's been 100% occupied for nine years now. Um, we truly do believe it's the best place for folks to live in the city of Baton Rouge. And uh, before he passed away in January, uh, the Juno's father, the patriarch of their family, uh, had lived there for 15 years along with his wife, who preceded him in death uh, about 10 years before that. Uh, a few more of our accreditations. These are some master planner projects that we conducted. Uh, apparently, the gentlemen, like, before I joined the firm, they liked to gallivant around the Caribbean. So you see a couple of projects in Panama and San Susi Island. Uh, those were just some, they, we had been contacted by wealthy individuals or third-party organizations who were looking for a hand in developing um, commercial avenues on islands that they have made, owned or operated in the Caribbean. And the Junos sure weren't remiss in taking them up on the offer. So, But with the success that the companies had in business, um, you know, we, we are God-fearing men and we do believe in giving back to the community. And so the Housing and Education Foundation was established in the Boyles Parish. It's a 200, I believe it's 250 acres of pristine woodlands in the Boyles Parish that the Junos converted into a safari park, uh, where they host, uh, a, I believe there's a pair of giraffes, uh, there's ostriches and emus and bison and ibexes and water buffaloes and uh, warthogs and peacocks, and we host boys and girls clubs, disadvantaged children from the city of New Orleans. We bring them out to, to show them that maybe life isn't as bleak as they've experienced in their young years thus far. 
give them a bit of taste of the wilderness and the wildlife. And, uh, you know, God's been good to them, so we like to give back uh, as well. little mantra for our company is something that customers come to us with an expectation and we like to redefine it by showing them what's possible above and beyond what they thought they could get for the money that they come to the table with. But here's the real reason we're here to talk today. The old VA hospital. Uh, it's 48 acres of lush oak laden property that I've called home now for 14 months. Um, I actually reside in a small one bedroom trailer immediately adjacent to the old chapel. Um, Got to keep an eye on the place. You know, the ghosts and the coyotes, they run amok. So, got to keep them in line. But it's a total of 10 historic buildings that were constructed between 1923 and 1947 uh, with the help of Dr. Butch Martin, who I don't know if he's a member of the society or not, but with his help, we were able to push past a small hiccup that had occurred with the National Park Service and get each of these 10 buildings designated as a contributing structure to a historic district. Uh, so they are, in fact, all now protected under Mississippi State and National Park Service guidelines. Uh, so we have to act um, in accordance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation Historic Properties. So that basically means we can't tear them down, we can't punch holes in the side of them. Uh, and we wouldn't want to anyway. I mean, if you've had the opportunity to visit the site during cruising on the coast, uh, it's hard not to fall in love with this property when you just, you know, mingle in and amongst the oak trees or walk, uh, walk the parade field. So, our concepts are varied, uh, but they're strong as a cohesive network, and we really think that it'll operate uh, very well as something that the Gulf Coast can be proud of. Uh, our first project, which you may have seen in the paper a few months back, is going to be a Holiday Inn Resort which is these two buildings here, buildings 62 and 57. Uh, building 62 was constructed in 1931, which was the second series of buildings to be built. Building 57, which mimics it nearly identically, was built almost 16 years later in 1947. Uh, both of these buildings, when they were constructed, were built for the purpose of treating acute psychiatric conditions. Um, at the time, and I was speaking with a gentleman earlier about this, the onset of certain psychiatric conditions happens to also take place during the age when young men join military services uh, between the ages of 18 and 24. And so while they go off to war and come back, primary care physicians might think, oh, well, you're just suffering from shell shock or uh, what is now known as PTSD, when in fact they might be suffering under the onset of psychosis or uh, schizophrenia, which can act very quickly and do statistically strike young men between the ages of 18 and 24. So uh, these two buildings were built specifically for the purpose of treating them, and uh, we're going to be turning them into a, it's a three and a half star resort product. It's a family oriented product. Uh, you bring your grandkids, bring your kids out. They've got a year long event calendar for keeping everybody happy. But in conjunction with a resort style pool built where the old rehabilitation pool was, building 76, uh, we think it's something that can certainly add to the commercial market here in Gulfport. And we're pretty excited to start moving dirt. Uh, I believe May, maybe as late as June 1st, uh, you'll start to see bulldozers out there and tearing up the pavement. Uh, not to be missed, though, something else that's recently been published is the June 11th Hot Rod Power Tour visit. Um, apparently there's a week-long, you know, north coast to south coast travel of a 50 18 wheelers with thousands of antique cars and they're traveling from Indianapolis, Indiana down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this is their sixth of seven stops. So please uh, come out to the site. It's open to all spectators. There's not an admission to get in. Um, I don't know if, I don't believe there's any parking going to be available on site just because of the sheer volume of space that the 50 big rigs are going to take up. But I think it's parking down at Barksdale Pavilion or in the adjacent parking lots on Courthouse Road, and you walk on site, and you get to experience and everything, and then you get to leave. So that's what we're most excited about is those events coming up. Also, the young lady mentioned the uh, barbecue under the oaks. Um, Melanie Clark and I and Whitney Summerall have been uh, working through the logistics of moving the barbecue under the oaks from a private residence to our facility. Uh, they're going to be taking up 
a large portion of the oak grove over here, hence the under the oaks name of the event. Um, but it, it will be taking place on March 28th from 11 to 2.30. And it's something that we're really looking forward to hosting for the next, uh, hopefully, number of years in succession. And it should be a good time. I think we have 30 teams this year coming. And, uh, there's a $20,000 drawdown, and there's a corn toss tournament, so and great barbecue, not to mention. So, but a more chronological history of the site, um, and Jim Miller might spank my hand later when I get most of this wrong. But uh, 1915, it was donated from the F. B. Hughes family over to the Mississippi Exposition Company. Uh, the name Centennial Plaza harkens back to 1918. It was supposed to host the centennial event to celebrate the t Mississippi being the 20th state to join the Union. Uh, unfortunately, with the onset of Spanish flu epidemic, as well as uh, World War I involvement on the part of the U.S., the idea at the time of hosting an exposition lost its luster. So the site was then turned over to the Department of the Navy, who operated it as a quasi-quarantine facility, but also a training facility uh, for about five years until our involvement in that conflict ended. Uh, it was then turned over to the Public Health Service, who operated it as a hospital, number 74. Um, the Public Health Service was later absorbed into a number of different entities, which became the Veterans Affairs Bureau and then the Veterans Administration. Uh, and it was operated as a psychiatric services hospital up until 2005. When the storm came and knocked the bottom out of the infrastructure, uh, the government at the time didn't think that with the amount of development that was underway in Biloxi that reopening the site made much fiscal sense. So they uh, pumped a bunch of money into the site to environmentally abate all the 1950s lead and 1960s asbestos materials and got rid of all the underground diesel tanks and rendered the entire site environmentally abated and 100% clean. Uh, they put new roofs on, new doors, new windows, and turned the site over to the city. And it took uh, a couple of years for the city to get its wheels underneath it, but when it did, they uh, hosted a developer summit, which eventually led to the developer who had the property before us. And then in 2013, my boss, Stuart Juno, got a phone call from the city. And this is what we plan on doing with it. Uh, you'll see the 10 historic buildings are maintained. Uh, off to the west of 62 and 57 is the uh, resort style pool with a lazy river for the kids. An open air breezeway that will connect the two buildings and a port cachet with a check-in station. Uh, we think that's going to be the anchor for our property and that's really going to drive development and drive our marketing efforts. Once that dirt gets churned, <coughs> We think the rest of the buildings will fill up quickly. Off to the east, you might notice some of our single-family cottages. Uh, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, there were single-family homes that existed for the use of the officers on site who uh, ran the facility. And the storm, again, wiped those out. But we want to reinstall those, and not just in name, but also in ambiance with the aesthetics of the properties. They had nice planter boxes out the bay windows on the uh, the living rooms, and they had, I guess unless you've ever lived in somewhere like Keesler, you know, on a military base, the, it has a military aesthetic to it, but it can still be a very warm and inviting single-family home. So we'll be reinstalling about 16 of those in the Oak Grove, uh, along with a five-star in product facing our little Hemingway pond here. Um, we hope to have a very strong wedding component to this property, uh, where you know, folks will stay at the hotel, they'll have their weddings catered by a restaurant building here, they'll have the ceremony in the old chapel or even on the island in the middle of our lake, and then have the reception in the parade field. And we hope, you know, every young lady in the South wants to come get married at Centennial Plaza. <laughs> um, the two buildings bordering the parade field, these are some of the oldest that still exist. 1923 is when they were built. Uh, as well as these two here and building number five. These are going to be a combination of office space and retail. doesn't bother discussion too much. Those are market driven. Those are what's going to pay the rent and allow us to operate what we think really is going to be the, the life spread of the property, which is uh, the parade field 
or what we're calling our festival marketplace. A year-long event calendar featuring <coughs> barbecue, art markets, uh, you know, wine festivals to rival the ones that you have over in Destin. Uh, everything from July 4th to Thanksgiving, Memorial Day, Easter, Christmas, uh, somewhere for families to go. Somewhere for families to go, take the kids, let them run around like the little heathens that they may be. And let mom and dad peruse the jewelry and the music and listen to a string quartet or, you know, just go wander amongst the, the bike trails that we've got bordering the properties. Uh, and then pack the kids up and go home after a nice fun day. And in conjunction with our destination pier, if anybody's ever been over to Galveston, you've seen the old Navy pier that they had that Landry's Inc. took and put a bunch of money of attractions on top. They've got uh, 10, you know, fair type carnival rides with the roller coasters and the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. And that's exactly what we've mimicked right here. Uh, probably won't be the same size or breadth as the one in Galveston just because they have Houston to draw from and we don't necessarily have a market that big. But it should be uh, so it should, you know, our tourism number estimates range in the half million visitors a year category um, to the point where it can potentially move the sales tax revenue uh, for the city of Gulfport almost eight tenths of one percent, <coughs> which is a fair number, um, which is where we're hoping to draw some interest from the state and the federal government to allow us to kind of streamline this, getting this permitted right here is not easy. So, you know, any, any sort of interest we can get. Um, on the part of the federal government is helpful, uh, which is where the centennial event coming up in 2017 and the World War I commemoration, which takes place right around the same time, we're hoping to host both of those uh, on site. Uh, we've, you know, Mayor Billy Hughes is on the Bicentennial Celebration Selection Committee, which is a mouthful, and we hope to be selected as the site to host the main event in 2017. Uh, and we've already been contacted by a gentleman who's under congressional authority to select a site for the Mississippi State World War I uh, celebration as well. And because of how the site was meant for one but was delayed because of the other, they think that both of those projects can get kicked off on our site um, you know, rather successfully and that uh, we should have a pretty good draw. And by then, we'll certainly have enough parking, as you can see on the north there. But some small details regarding the project. Most of these I've already touched on. Um, like I said, come probably six months into construction of the hotel, we hope to be able to tear down that front chain link fence, which I know everyone is desperate for us to do. A few of the amenities that will feature, like I said before, the town square concept, the stage area on the parade field, uh, the Festival Marketplace, which is our year-long calendar of events. Uh, the Walking Paths, which I may have not touched on enough. There's a wildlife preserve to the northwest of the property that Mayor Hughes is interested in us tying in with not only walking paths, but also Coffee Creek. Uh, we're in discussions right now to put a wire in, a weir, wire, weir, a weir in Coffee Creek to raise the water levels to where you can actually kayak and paddle, paddleboard up from our site into the wildlife preserve and back. So a nice little water feature for, again, kids, families. Um, but these are the basic utilities that we will have available to anybody who say, you know, cruising on the coast or uh, hot rod power tour who want to make use of the site. Some of the data just on the roads and the parking. Uh, two and a half miles of sidewalks. So. I hope you brought boots made for walking. We got lots of space. The historic status of the site uh, in 1980 is when it was actually determined eligible as uh, a nationally national register eligible district, and it's because of that eligibility letter that the state historic preservation officer uh, Ken Papool was literally and figuratively able to stand in front of the bulldozers post Katrina and say, "Listen." You can't just willy-nilly tear these buildings down. Um, it's through his efforts and the SHPO's office that those buildings still stand. And also mm -hmm. the former administrator's, uh, administration's office mayor or uh, and his group are also responsible as well. 
the Shippo's office then filed the paperwork in May of 2010 to have the property designated as a Mississippi landmark, which then furthered the protection that each of the buildings uh, was able to enjoy. And when we came on board, we've had the lease for the property now for about 15 months. Uh, it started in November of 2013. So a few months later is when we filed the application with the National Park Service to have it put on the National Register of Historic Places, to, again, to further the protection that it enjoyed. And in February is when they were all certified as historic structures, and the Part 1 applications for the historic tax credits were approved. Um, Ken Papool and his book supervisors have all been on site. They all love our development plan. They're all on board with everything. Uh, we've met with the County Board of Supervisors, Governor Bryant, uh, the City Administration. Couldn't be happier with where we're headed. So. And this again is <laughs> he invites me here and then he interrupts me. <laughs> well, again, this is what we, you know, the, I, the reason I have a separate section here for this is that this is the life spread of the property. This is what is going to get you folks inside. It's what's going to. Um, you know, continue the, the, the retail aspects of the site into the future is to to open up to you folks what I've been able to enjoy, having lived on site now for 14 months. Um, there's something about this property that is just, it gets a hold of you, and you want to go back every day. You want to walk among the oak trees every day. It's so peaceful. It's so serene. And to be so close to the beach and to a downtown municipal area, it's, it's one of a kind. It truly is. My bosses have been doing this uh, development business for you know 30 years now. They've never seen anything like this, and they knew when they saw this property the first time they had to they had to be a part of it. So, with that, we hope to start an engaging, active, um, weekly you know art markets, farmers markets, fish markets, but also monthly events, uh, wine festivals, everything I touched on earlier, and then. Throughout the year, maybe three or four big quarterly events like Cruise on the Coast, the Hot Rod Power Tour. Uh, we hope to establish uh, a blues festival to rival the one up in Jackson. And Stu Juno, being from New Orleans, he knows some of the jazz producers down there, and we've already invited them in. And they're already beginning to develop contacts in the area, and, uh, talking to producers and talking to musicians, talking to concessions folks to see how could we run a blues festival. Uh, soul festival, you know, things that really do celebrate the spirit of the music of Mississippi, um, but on the Gulf Coast where people can also enjoy the beach and the sun. So that's the initial, that's the where we sit right now. This is just a conceptual yearly calendar of the things I touched on earlier. Uh, you can see barbecue under the oaks there is tabbed for the end of March. Uh, we did enjoy a successful Boy Scout jamboree earlier as well as cruising the coast. <coughs> Casa of Harrison County also conducted a Halloween party in the old chapel on site. They raised about $35,000 for their charity. Uh, mayor Hughes' band played, which was a treat to see a mayor dressed up as Beetlejuice banging on the drums. But uh, and this this is just the beginning. You know, with 48 acres, we got lots of room to grow. So anything you see here, if you have any suggestions, I hope that you, Jim is going to be sending my contact information out to everyone. If you'd like a tour of the property, give me a call. We'll try and set something up where we can get a bunch of people in and just wander in amongst the buildings. Um, because you folks have obviously, through your attendance here, you've obviously shown that you care about the historical significance of the city of Gulfport. And yes, sir? You all want to be able to cross over on Highway 9? Uh, <laughs> Surprisingly enough, I get this question rather frequently. Um, when we go back, I'll, I'll go back to the site uh, photo here in a second, but um, no, to answer your question. Uh, we've done enough developments to this point, and we've done market studies to where we just, for the amount of people that use them, um, they're too expensive. They're about a million and a half dollars a piece, and at the, old, at the Armed Forces Retirement Home down the street from us, I drive by there six times a day, and I have never seen a single person use that thing. What we are going to do, and what we do have preliminary approval from Mississippi Department of Transportation, is a pedestrian-controlled stop walk. Um, it'll be a stoplight in between Courthouse Road and Hughes Avenue. Uh, we're going to be installing 
a wide lane of decorative red brick pavers from our site that will continue across the street to the sidewalk that will open up into the beach plaza. And with those two bordering stoplights, our stoplight, and just the nature of people constantly going back and forth, the traffic will slow down. And it won't be a, a safety impediment to anyone. But that is a consideration that we've encountered and, um, between the stoplight and the almost impossible to miss walking corridor that we're going to have installed along the highway. Uh, we think that should suffice for <coughs> ferrying people from our site uh, over to the pier across the street. But again, if you see anything in here that you think might be out of place, um, my email inbox is always open. You know, we love suggestions on events that you think might be more successful in June than a beach volleyball tournament. Um, send them my way, and we'll ferry them up the chain. And you know, everybody's voice is listened to effectively. Is, is the the message I want to convey? Because this is going to be a community property, and you folks have shown yourselves to really have the best interests of the city at heart. So we want to take your considerations into account. And oh, this is just some ancillary programming data for the hotel just to show how we're able to fit uh, some of our requirements inside the old confines of the building. Uh, each of the suites you see here is 400, 500 square feet. Uh, it's 152 rooms. Uh, we've got a little kids arcade area here, bathrooms uh, to use in conjunction with the pool. Just a bunch more of these. There's five floors, so pardon my flipping through. Uh, this here is where we'll be in building 62 on the east or the western facing wing. Uh, this will be your dining facilities, uh, your bar area, your kitchen area. So um, we really have managed to to fit as many of the brand standards that Holiday Inn Resort requires, and it's a, it's a unique product that they have. There's only 19 of them in the country. There's only eight or 38 of them worldwide. And they are s s built, they are hand built to cater to families of four. 15% uh, of the rooms that we put in have to have bunk beds for kids. They've got to have little entertainment centers, the little PlayStations and the Xboxes. They have to be built into the rooms for the kids. Uh, you have to have a, an amazing pool to entertain the kids. You have to have a kids' rec area. Uh, and so it's something that for you know, $140, $150 a night, your kids can run around. Oh, and they also eat free, three meals a day. So, so this is our Porta Cache building. This is the only new construction with regards to this component here. Um, but as my boss likes to say, this is this is our mantra. It's, you know, not <coughs> seeing what's there now, which might not exactly elicit oohs and ahs from everyone, but it's you know what we can put in place within the next few years. By 2020, you know, I've, I've had extensive discussions with the economic development director of the city of Gulfport, and with our project and with other projects he's got in the works, we really think that um, Gulfport will achieve the status of tier one tourism destination uh, by 2020. And that just means generally nicer amenities and uh, a lot more of just a it's something that you know Mayor Hughes really wants to achieve, and it's something that we hope to be able to contribute to. So, I believe all that's left are these renderings that we got. So this is what the old, this is what the historic entrance to the facility will be transformed into. More to the gentleman's point, this is the beginning of the red brick pavers that'll cross over Highway 90. A new traffic circle will be installed. You can see here pedestrian traffic here. This inner loop is going to majoritively be closed to vehicular traffic. It's, we're trying to establish a bit of a retail corridor in and amongst these six buildings here to kind of foster the idea of it's OK to park, get out, walk around, you'll be safe. Uh, something similar to a Rosemary Beach or um, what's the other? Seaside, yes, Seaside. Um, you know where they have their central green area there? Did you know that their retention pond is immediately underneath that? That's something similar to what we're trying to achieve. It's taking something unconventional and covering it with the familiar. And so we'll be taking an old parade field and 
all the utilities that we have to install and yet making it feel like an open air marketplace, something you might find in Europe. Uh, that'll operate in conjunction with the hotel, with the resort, you know, the river pool here, rock waterfall, open air breezeway, outdoor dining area. And this all here is new construction, but as you can see, we're leaving uh, the two uh, existing buildings virtually intact. And this is a view from the water tower showing our future residential development along with the pier. This is back when we kind of conceptualized it as a Santa Monica type pier instead of the Galveston one, so part of the thinness of it. I don't know why there's a Spanish galleon in the back corner. <laughs> <laughs> forget, forget you saw that. I don't know if we can, I don't know if we can deliver that. Uh, again, this is this will be our, our Hemingway pond with the gazebo reinstalled for weddings and ceremonies. Uh, the little five-star end product. You know, five to ten rooms to operate in synergy with the casinos. The casinos do their business incredibly well. We're not going to be acting in competition with them. We only want to offer a different sort of product for the same customer base. Uh, and then you can see, you know, the parade field in full effect there. And then the destination pier. Uh, with the you know semicircular beach plaza here, uh, we hope to, and it's something unique to the beaches of Gulfport. They're so beautiful. The city's done an amazing job keeping them immaculate. Uh, I you know I'll be running the along with marketing presentations <coughs> and things like that. I'm also the groundskeeper for the site, an environmental researcher, uh, a number of different hats that I wear. But I'll be mowing the site and I'll see three or four of their beach combing machines out there every day, you know, keeping it, you know, just as white and as sandy as you could hope for. Uh, so we hope to congregate all the people along the beach, because when you drive out there, you might see eight, ten people every block, but it doesn't feel like it's occupied. But if you were to congregate them all around a beacon, like what this pier may act as, uh, we really think that it'll just, it'll build on itself, it'll snowball. These little cabanas here, you see if anybody's been to uh, the beaches in France or, or Britain, they've got these cabanas where you, a television, a sink, a small refrigerator, that you can just rent for $50, $60 a day. Uh, these aren't going to be gou money gouging money makers for us. They're just ways to entice people to come to the beach uh, for a weekend. But that's something, that's, that's going to be our hardest project to achieve, but it's also the one that we're most excited about, and we honestly, we, we do hope to have that at least under construction by the time that the centennial event comes around. So, that's about all I've got. Uh, <coughs> go ahead back there. Well, so, we have about ten minutes for some questions. And I apologize if I ran a little long, but... No, that's no, fine. No, that's fine. <coughs> that's fine. <coughs> yes, sir. The Arconi is that permanent residence or permanent? No, yes, sir. They will be, um, because of the nature of the development, uh, we are employing historic tax credits as, as a mean of developing equity. And so technically we can't sell anything for the first five years. So they will be uh, for rent with the intent to buy later on down the road. Um, but they'll be on the order of 2,500 you know, 2, to 3,000 square feet. Um, and they will be for sale cottages. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I wonder if in all this complex of buildings, there might be a place for the uh, Gulfport Historical Society. <laughs> well, well, how I came to uh, how I came to Mr. Miller's attention is that him, Paul, and Joe um, had. I think Joe had. You might be able to speak more articulately to this, but you had discovered some glass negatives from a photographer who was also a Paul. Lewis Vail. Yeah, the, the Vail collection. And through their desire to exhibit these pieces, they contacted me, uh, and we had a wonderful site visit and toured around the property. And so I will say that right now I am actively endeavoring to find a spot for the Mississippi Historical or the Gulfport Historical Society and the works of the Vail collection and the works of Jim, Joe, and Paul. Uh, to find space for them on site. And 
it is a commercial enterprise. It is something that needs to make money. Uh, but the counter to that is it also, given the history of the site, needs to support the historical aspects of the region and of the city. So I'm doing absolutely everything I can to make that happen. I can say that. Yeah. I will point out to those of you who don't know that Paul Drummond is here, who owns uh, the, the Bell Collection, Glass Negatives, and Joe Tomasowski, who's worked with that. Also, we have uh, one of our Gulfport Redevelopment <laughs> people that's here tonight, Sal Nomenat. Sneaky. Sal. You mentioned you earlier. Short okay, another kind of be some more questions. Anybody else? I'm flashing these pictures. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was just telling Jim earlier, you know, as a Navy vet, these things get me really jazzed up. Uh, these are 85-year-old photographs. These are, um, you know, the young cadets and the young sailors who, in 1917, 1918 through 1923, trained on the facility when the old Centennial Exposition buildings, which you can see behind them here, still stood. Uh, the architecture on those buildings is incredible, and it's something that the future architects of the site did, I feel, successfully mimic to some degree. Now, these are meant to be ordinate, and they're meant to, to have lots of filigree in them, and our, our hospital system buildings weren't as, um, you know, laden with the Spanish porticos and the, the, the railings, but what stands now, I feel, is a really strong remembrance to this time. I really do. I really would love to find a place to exhibit these sorts of photographs within the halls of the property that we have there. So. I'd just like to say something. I grew up just right down the beach to yeah. the east of the VA, and uh, I spent some time on that property. My grandmother was a mover and shaker, and and she and Father Semenowski who was a chaplain there. Uh, he needed volunteers to help, you know, yeah. entertain at Christmas and all that. So mm -hmm. they enlisted uh, when I was a teenager and and we had to go the less violent ones, you know, we would play right play, you know, we play poker with them or blackjack or right. something, you know. And uh, and then my mother went into the wards <coughs> with Father Szymanowski to, you know, bring Christmas cheer to them. So I know that area. Well, really you're, well. well you're, you're spoiled, Ben. You've gotten to enjoy something that I don't know yeah. if everyone else here has. Also, so. there used to be American Legion baseball games played in the front park, right? Really? Yeah, I used to go to uh, baseball games. Yeah, I'm sure many of our uh, guests and members here have lots of other things that we could add to yeah. the I mean, again, and that's something, I'm, uh, I'm being selfish when I say I want to solicit your comments for our event calendar because with those, also will come memories and recollections that you have that will help to add to the chronology and the history that we're hoping to build. Um, you know, the, the site's been around a lot longer than any of us, and so we're hoping to honor that, and it is a component of our development that we do plan on keeping faith with, is the history and the, the uh, military heritage of the site. So. Okay, there's no more questions. I uh, appreciate all your coming tonight and we invite you to, to join us.